and there's also very new ones. Um, bear in mind, this is a mixed meetup, as in uh, there's people from external PA, uh, PA consulting and internal PA consulting, which is fine. I mean, that's one of the reasons we do these, um, say, six weekly meetups to uh, just share insights, ideas, um, um, and uh, what have you. Um, because it's our feeling that um, data science, AI has been built from the ground up uh, in the public domain. Um, and it's only fair if you use things from the public domain to um, every now and then give back. Um, today's session is going to be uh, ran by Nunzio, Nunzio Gatti, one of our consultants here at uh, PA, uh, who's got a host of experience with uh, computer vision. Um, we decided to not go in at the entry level, but uh, do uh, so assuming you guys know Python or R, or at least understand how um, uh, neural networks work. Um, and, and go one step beyond that um, to see what, um, um, yeah, what, uh, what, how you would apply neural nets to uh, computer vision. Questions will take as and when. Um, if you type them in, then uh, Su uh, Susanna and I will have um, a keen eye on the um, uh, chat screen. Um, so we can uh, we can uh, jump them uh, straight ahead. But um, if you are stuck, just uh, speak up, and we'll um, uh, we'll uh, we'll uh, address your question. Nuncio, are you ready? Yeah. Thanks, Willem. I am. Okay. So let me just share my my PowerPoint. So can you all see my slide? Yes. OK, so yeah, yes. welcome, you, welcome you all to this latest pizza session and thank you for joining. So yeah, like Willem said, I'm Nunzio Gatti, a data scientist based in the London office and they have been a PA for the last two years and something. So yeah, today uh, I'm going to talk about computer vision and I'm going to describe the most common algorithm used to accomplish you know, this task. Also going to give you some details about different uh, uh, types of model that can be used and give you a relatively quick overview of one use case where computer vision has been applied and I would add successfully. So that is for is a brief summary for the theoretical part. For the practical part, I've prepared a Jupyter notebook when we are going to see how to build a computer vision model from, from scratch. So let's start because we have quite a few things to cover. So, OK, computer vision is an interdisciplinary scientific field that deals with how computers can gain high level understanding from both videos or images. So the most common algorithm or yeah, structure used for performing this type of task is called CNN. CNN means convolutional neural network, and it's a type of net or neural network which allows the correct classification of different images. So just a bit of math theory behind that. Formally, convolution is a math operation that takes an input two functions, and uh, so the input signal and the in this case, impulse response and produces a third function that ex expresses how the shape of one is modified by the other one. So you can see here, yeah, two signals. This is the, the our input one. We actually apply convolution. And here is our output. So basically, the main concept here is we're going to apply some sort of signal to our image and see how the image has been changed by the signal itself. So in order to do that, in order to do that, uh, we use matrices called kernels. A kernel is basically a matrix that is applied to the image in order to emphasize certain features or remove some other ones. Because basically computer vision ideally will work like our eyes. So basically if we see something that is shaped in a certain form or has a certain color, 
we know because of our past experience that that thing maybe is a car or is a building or whatever. So the main task of, of this kind of neural network is trying to get some features and try to learn for the input in order to be able to classify correctly, you know, the, the, the input itself. So let's see how this works. So yeah, we have this kernel. In this case, is a two by two kernel. And we're going to slide the kernel over the image along the axis. And when we do that, of course, we're going to consider a portion of image at every application of the kernel. So for example, if we see the, the red, uh, the red uh, square, so in order to put the kernel, we have to multiply element wise the portion of the input with the kernel. So we're going to have zero times zero plus zero times one plus zero times two plus zero times three. And all and this unique result that we get from this operation is going to be the output, is going to be mapped into the output. So let's do maybe an example different than zero. Let's do like this like 37. It's gonna be three times zero plus four times one it is four, six times twelve, six times two is twelve. 7 times 3 is 21, and the sum gives 37. So all these numbers in the input, they represent the, the pixel values of the image itself. And as you probably know, the pixel goes from 0 to, to 255. So if it's black, it's a 0. If it's 255, it's a white. And basically, yeah, we are going in this way, how I will explain in a more detailed way later, we are going to get the important features that are that are going to help us to classify correctly the image. So just a more clarification, if you are kind of confident with this topic, uh, you sometimes you can also find the word filters. So uh, kernels refers to a true D array of weights, like in this case. Filters refers to 3D structure, so basically multiple uh, kernels stuck together. So let's see what we have, what happens when we have a multidimensional input image. So, you know, the color image, they, are, they have like three channels, RGB, red, green, and blue. So we're going to basically to do the same operation applied to each channel. And at the end, we're going to sum all the, the three outputs we get in order to get the, let's say, the final output. So now I'm, because this is quite theoretically, now I will show you uh, practically how this uh, our filter works. Let me just sh change my switch my screen. So uh, stop presenting. Stop presenting. Just a sec because you have multiple screens. Sometimes it's not to manage. Let me know when you can actually see my screen. Yes, yes I can, can see your screen. Okay, so in this uh, this page that was that link helps you to figure out in a more like kind of practical way how a kernel works. So yeah, this is a, an image. And as I said, yeah, the matrix on the left contains numbers between 0 and 255, which each correspond to the brightness of one pixel in the picture. So yeah, this is basically the original input that we were considering. And this is how a filter, a kernel in this case looks like. So based on what we want to do, for example, we want to sharpen the image or blur the image, we'll get like different values in the filter. But so let's see how it looks. So if we want, for example, to sharpen, we'll get these default values. And this is how the operation is accomplished. So being a three by three, we are going to consider every like three by three portion from the input image, three by three window. And uh, this, this basically this portion after you, as you can see, we do all the operations. So we multiply the pixel value by the kernel is going to be like, it's going to be, let's say, transformed into a one single pixel into the output. So as you can see, in this case, we'll get this number 65. And it's all the same as as like we slide uh, the kernel. So every three by three windows is mapped into output. So we'll get, of course, a smaller output, which will contains, let's say in this case, the 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 the, the thing we need. So we want like to sharpen. 
but there are some model fields that we can try. So like blur, if we want to blur the image, as you can see, the numbers in the filter in, in the in the kernel has changed, have changed. And yeah, in this case, you can if you scroll over like uh, all the like of the window, you can actually see all the all the calculations. And another good stuff from this website is that, yeah, we still. You can actually also upload your image or do live video. So if you want, for example, to sharpen, you can actually modify the value and you can see how the image has changed. So uh, yeah, these are like black and white images, so we'll get for just like one layer. But normally, yeah, if it is like color, it's going to be again exactly the same operation, but with you know three different layers. And uh, yes, yeah, so hopefully I give you a better understanding of how filter works, kernel works. So let me just go back to the slide. Hopefully in a reasonable amount of time. I don't know, do you have any question for now about filters? And in the meantime, I found there are slides. Loading. So yeah, we are back to slide. Let's see, since it's like eight. So yeah, this is you can find this link on the slide. Uh, so now yeah, let's see how a complete CNN looks like, and let's analyze its different parts. So this is a complete CNN, and uh, the one I was explaining now like all the filters getting features is covered by this convolutional layer is called when we actually we are trying to apply the convolutional operation in order to get like features that will help us to do the classification in the end so as you can see here there are like multiple let's say layers because normally you don't apply one filters but you apply a relatively high number of filters uh, uh, in order to to get you know as many features as possible, so let's see the next uh, the next layer now in order is called max pooling. Let's see what it does. So basically, uh, the pooling layer is responsible for reducing the special size of feature map after the convolutional layer. So yeah, the input of the pooling will be the output of the convolutional and is generally called feature map because. Yeah, it contains features. So yeah, let's see how it works. So uh, in this case, the, the concept is slightly is slightly similar to the kernel one. So we are just considering based on uh, which dimension we want to consider. Like in this case, we are doing like three by three pooling. We are just going to consider like three by three window in the, imp in the feature map. We are going to slide along the axis all those windows. And if we are using max pooling, we are just retain the highest value of the pixel. For example, in this case, here we have like two, two, one, zero, but because we are doing max, we just keep two. If it is average pooling, we are going to average everything up and, uh, and keep that value and map that value into the output. Normally, average is not very used because you can actually stand a uh, kind of wrong information. So max pooling is the one that we'll probably see most of the times. But yeah, now let's see why we need this, because it's pretty, everything is pretty, I can understand it's pretty theoretical. So the, as I said, the pooling layer is responsible for reducing the special size, but real, why, why are the practical reason of doing that? Why we want to reduce this is because to decrease the computational power required to process the data through the monotonic reduction. So uh, normally when we, we 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 are dealing with like many images, many different layers. Uh, so during like training time, it can actually requires like takes a lot of time, a lot of computational resources. And basically doing this, we can reduce all those resources and time. But probably the most important reason is this one here. 
It is useful to extracting dominant features with a rotational and positional invariant. Let's see what that means. So yeah, pooling uh, basically helps, like I said, to uh, helps to make the representation invariant to small translation of the input. As you can see here, we have two different input that more or less contains the same object or whatever this is. But it's like in every input is light uh, basically changed is a bit rotate or a bit bigger. So the 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 concept here if, is that if the rotation of the uh, change of position is small enough, so it means that does not bring in a new largest element if you are doing like max pooling. When we do the max pooling operation, it's gonna be basically it's gonna be exactly the same result even if the image is changed and this is good mostly because when you actually do neural network you yeah you want you want to learn about using the training set but the main key is probably to the network should be able to generalize so this means that even imagine i don't know if we have like uh, something like a cat so if, if our training set contains, just I don't know, uh, the uh, image of cats, but in a certain position, if we don't do something like this, probably the, the, the network will just learn that if we found the cat in that position is a cat, but if we find the same cat in another position, it's not going to be able to recognize it. So just to give you another example of that, so imagine in this, windows everything is zero apart from these two for example so in the first when we consider the first window the max will be two but imagine the image is a bit like uh on the left side let's say again if everything is zero and the maximum is going to be two still we're going to get the same result so again that will will avoid that changing the position and maybe rotate will like it's not going to be changing the output of the pooling layer so yeah uh, normally uh, normally uh, cnn for the 90 percent of the layer is going to be a sequence of convolutional and max pooling convolutional max pooling this is because and how we'll show you later Every time we do convolution, we are aiming at getting different type of features and stuff. And of course, pooling will help us uh, to reduce the, the spatial side and all for the reason I explained to you in the, in the previous slide. So now let's see the final layer that is this is so-called fully connected. So fully connected layer is yeah, always the last layer of a convolutional network. Its main task is about learning nonlinear combination of the high level features. So let's see what this means. So basically, uh, uh, until here, until basically at this exactly this point, uh, we are we we were uh, busy trying to get all the features, all the stuff. Now the next step is try to learn nonlinear combination. So in kind of lay terms, uh, uh, let's say yeah, we are going to provide as much information as needed in order to get the, the, the right output. And the first operation we do is this called flatten. So flattening operation is basically converting the data into a one dimensional array for inputting it to the next layer. So basically we flatten the output of the convolutional layers uh, to create a single uh, long feature vector. So if we go back to this metric, so imagine that this is the, the, the last feature map we get that we have to ingest this into a fully connected layer. So this is like three is five by five. So after we flatten, we are going to get a long vector of 25 elements. And yeah, fully connected layer, it's simply a, a feed forward is called neural network where all the, all the nodes from the layer, let's say X, are connected to all the nodes from the layer X plus one. And so this is this is the main concept why the the, the network is able to to learn nonlinear combination. Uh, after this, the, the last we have is called output layer. The output layer is basically the layer we need 
is where the, the assignment of the label to the input image happens. So in this case, uh, we are going to have 10 different elements, 10 different nodes. This is because we are going to try to classify uh, a number. So basically, uh, yeah, the number that goes like from 0 to 10, so we're going to get like 10 different elements. And so every input here, after uh, all the operation that happens in this fully connected layer, is going to re is going to re to receive a kind of a number. So we normally, when we are talking about a multi-label classification, like in this case, uh, we are going to apply an activation function called uh, softmax. So basically, activation function, like I'm, I'm going to show you during the practical part of the session. An activation function is basically a function that uh, introduces the non-linearity. So it's basically mapping an input into an output, but just not, it's not just a linear mapping. A softmax is basically transform, is, is receiving a vector in input, uh, is assigning to each element of this vector, is assigned the probability, and the probability that will sum up to one. So in this case, to every class, a probability will be associated, but probably actually very likely the number two, the probability to number two will be the highest one. So we're going to classify and to label the input image as like an image that contains the number two. Uh, this is more or less, yeah, how it works on general terms, the SNN. Now probably is the best way to to show you how we can build this from scratch. So yeah, I prepared a Jupyter notebook that we can see together and we can actually use to to build this CNN. Again, just let me switch my screen. Because yeah, everything sounds yeah, everything Actually, everything related with deep learning is pretty theoretical. So a practical example, I think, is the best thing to understand better. So can you see my screen? Yeah. I guess it's yeah. So uh, yeah, we yeah, this uh, you basically I'm going to send you this to Suzanne lately and probably she's going to to upload on, I don't know, Bitbucket on G3, but you can actually download and and have a go. So yeah, in this notebook, we'll go through the code to basically create a convolutional network to predict what is contained within an image. We have uh, this is uh, this this classes. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten classes. A, the image can contain an airplane, automobile, bird, cat, deer, dog frog, horse, sheep, and truck. So yeah, before actually moving on, just want to tell you something. So the, the main problem uh, is, is probably kind of unlikely that even if you're on, on a kind of computer vision project, it's very unlikely that you're going to build the model from scratch. This is because mainly for one reason. So considering we are talking about deep learning here, the main problem is uh, getting uh, a very high quality data set. So normally you should get data set contain, if you want to train a computer vision model, you should get data set containing like thousands and thousands of, of images. And uh, sometimes is because of maybe of the time uh, you can, you're not able to get your, basically because there is none, none when you actually can, can get all those images. Sometimes you basically will use uh, a technique called a pre-trained model. So you are going to use something from uh, something, a, a model that someone else has built for its own specific use case. And if the specific use case is pretty similar to what you are doing now, so for example, here we are predicting these kind of images. I don't know if I if I had a, a problem a project. I don't know where to to detect. I don't know how to play or something like that. I could use this model that another guy has done, and I can like tune something in order to make this model available for my use case. And in fact, for this example here, we are going to use a data set that is pre 
uh, that is gathered is pre-gathered, let's say, in the in the in the Keras library that I'm going to use. So this data set contains 60,000 images. So imagine how difficult it would be to, to get 60,000 images and label all of them. The images are quite tiny. It's 32 by 32 pixel. This is because, so even if you are going to, in the 95% of the computer vision model also on the market, they are also, they are always trained on very small images. This is again, uh, is already like, uh, if we have multiple, uh, diff like many different layers, uh, all the mathematical operation between these layers will take uh, a very like a big amount of time. And of course, increasing the size of the input images, this time will increase exponentially. So apart from some companies like the use case that I'm going to tell you later, even the model trained by Google or Facebook, uh, they uh, they always have like they also are trained on very kind of small images. So yeah, like I said, ten possible images, ten possible labels, uh, and yeah, data set size we have sixty thousand images, fifty thousand will be used for training, and ten thousand will be used for testing. So uh, yeah, we are going to use there are uh, very quickly there are many different libraries uh, open source libraries in Python. There is TensorFlow, Keras. Cafe, Teano, PyTorch, and uh, but normally this is the 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 most used one. TensorFlow is is train is um, a library developed by Google, owned by Google, and uh, but the problem with TensorFlow is that all is not very human friendly. Let's say so all the code and instruction they are very they are quite like tough to remember, so they're not like very easily readable. And also there is an, this other library called Keras. This Keras is extremely easier to read than TensorFlow. So now TensorFlow has decided to integrate Keras inside its own library. So when you actually build a neural network, I will also always suggest to use Keras. So we're importing this Cypher 10 data set. And let's see. So yeah, it contains 50,000 images. Every image is a 32 by 32. And because they are like colored images, they have like three different layers, red, green, and blue. And uh, the the white train, it basically contains 50,000 rows, again, one for each, uh, ex, um, one for each like training instances. And it contains another column that is the label itself. So for example, if we print, yeah, We'll get the label nine, so the label goes from zero to nine, and and yeah, uh, yeah. Every image again is thirty-two by thirty-two by three. Let's try to print an image and see how it looks like. So we use a library called Matplotlib. So for example, if we print the image at twelve, this supposedly is a horse, but yeah, using a thirty-two by thirty-two resolution is not very easy. Is a, easily understanding to uh, easily recognizable. But yeah, if we check the label uh, for these training instances, the label is seven, and the seventh label is zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven is a horse. So yeah, now, pro but we have a problem. So what we really want is the probability of each of the different classes. Remember when I said the output layer will contain one element for each class we had in our training set. So also here we need 10 output neurons in our neural network. And since we have 10 output neurons, also our label must match this kind of structure as well. So we're going to transform this label from a single integer into this is called the one not vector. So basically one not vector means that uh, the now the label will be a vector which contains 10 elements and and uh, nine out of 10 of these elements will be zero. And the element which actually match with the class integer class will be one. So in this case, the seventh element will be one like is the like is is shown here. 
So we're going to transform using these two categorical function from Keras, all the uh, our like our label from the training set and the label for our test set. And the common step we do is we actually normalize because we get pixel from zero to 255. So and also consider this is a gradient uh, method, a base gradient method. We also may get some like let's say problems. When we train, so it's always always good to to normalize if we if we have like different scales. So this, let's say, can be reassumed as a preprocessing part. That actually is what takes 90% of the time when you want to build a model like this. Now uh, we actually will see the architecture, and the architecture will be like this. So there are there is like I said a sequence of Conv layers and max pool, uh, max pool layers. Oh, sorry. So we have two conv layers. Uh, I will also explain what all the, what this number means. Max pool layer. We also have dropout. Dropout is a method in order to is used to improve the generalization uh, uh, performance. So this is because dropout means we are going to literally drop out some nodes from the layers. So for example, if here we have probability of a dropout 0 0.25, so it means that every four element, every four nodes, we are going to drop out one. And we have drop out here and also here. 0 0.5 means that we are every every iteration of the training during the training, we are going to drop out 50% of the nodes. In this way, you know the, the model can. Uh, because we don't want that the model learns too much from the training. It just need to learn, you know, the general features. And uh, otherwise, it will not be able to generalize when we 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 uh, we try to use our model on test set or more in general on some like unseen data set. So yeah, two conv layer, max pooling, drop out again, two conv layer, max pooling, drop out. This is the full connected one. And this is full connected one with 10 neurons. And as I said, softmax, that is one for each for each class. Uh, this is very, very easy. Normally, you have like 100 of layers like this. So yeah, we are going to create the model. Uh, yeah, very quickly, the model is going to be our a type uh, like a sequential type. So sequential means that is a kind of linear model. So every there are no branch, no like uh, parallel stuff. Normally, if you want to do a more complex model, you should use functional instead of sequential. And now we start to add the layers to our model. So first of all, we add the convolutional layer. This 32 is called depth number of channels but this is the number of kernels or the filters we are going to apply. So we're going to apply 32 filters to the input image. Each of these 32 filters will be a 3 by 3 filter. Here we have the activation function that is ReLU to introduce the non-linearity. We also have something called padding. Padding is basically used because when we actually slide the kernel over the image, the edge, the pixel at the edge, they are not very involved, let's say, in the process. They're just going to be considered one time because, you know, the, the, the filter is going to, the, the, the pixel in the, in the center of the image are going to be overlapping when we apply uh, the filters like multiple times. So we do, do, doing this padding, we are just adding some pixel to the image in order to involve more the edge pixel into the process. And here we're going to send the input shape that is 32 by 32 by 3. Same thing here. We do the max pooling and the pooling size. So the, the, the dimension of the window, I, I told you earlier, is going to be 2 by 2. We drop out. After we apply another two convolutional layer. And so as you can see, these numbers changed. So normally, we, when the deeper you go into the network, the higher is going to be the number of filters you apply. This is basically a rule of thumb. Uh, yeah, two convolutional layers, again, max pooling, drop out, we flatten. So everything is, go is going to, we're going to have here a very long vector. We add a convolution, uh, fully connected layer with 512 neurons. We, we just like switch off 50% of these neurons. 
and the output layer will be will contain like 10 neurons uh, which each of them will have the probability that an input uh, belongs to a certain class. Uh, okay, this is the summary of our model that has been built. Number of parameters, basically this is the number of weight and bias that we are going to, to train during the process. In total, we have like 2 million. Uh, we are going to compile, so calculate the loss using category, categorical cost entropy because we have like more than one uh, uh, label. Optimizer, how we're going to optimize this loss and the matrix we're going to, going to consider is the accuracy. We fit the model, we give an input uh, the train, the training set, the, the basically the image, the label that we want out encoding. Now we have these two numbers, batch size and epochs. So uh, batch size is how many, how many elements, how many input instances we are going to consider every time we do an iteration. And uh, this batch size is very useful because we are going to update the weights every time we do one iteration. So every time we analyze, we start to learn something on, on 32 images, we are going to update the weights. The epochs, uh, we, the difference is that we have an epoch when we we have uh, we are trying to learn something on all data sets, so all the input images. So as you can see here, you have like one, two, five, zero. This is the total number of iteration to reach one epoch because if you multiply thirty two by one, two, five, zero, you are got you are going to get forty thousand. That is going to be our new the size of our new training set because we also get 10,000 for the validation data set. So I'm not going to run this because it takes quite time. So yeah, you have uh, the debug is pretty useful. You can see the loss, the accuracy, the validation loss and the validation accuracy. So of course, as you can see, the more the highest is the epoch, the lowest will, will be the lower will be the, the loss and we'll get a higher accuracy. So after 20 epochs, we get 0 0.85 on training set and 0 0.78 on validation set. And this is because we normal, we are trying to learn, you know, all the features on the training set. And, you know, when we, we get in, we, we feed something unseen that, of course, we, we have not used to for the for the learning process. Of course, we are going to get something uh, let's say smaller, a smaller number. So here, yeah, we plot all the loss. You can see the training loss and the validation loss. So in our, in theory, the the more epoch you have, the lower be, will be the training. But there is something called uh, variance bias trade-off because yeah, it's true that you you probably if you if you do something like I don't know thousand epochs, you probably have accuracy ninety nine percent. But the validation loss, it will the the validation accuracy will be low as well because we 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 are we we learn too much on the specific training set, so our network is not able to generalize accuracy here. Now we are going to evaluate on our test set, so it's seventy seven percent. We save the model. When I say save the model, we basically save the weights, and now we are testing our own image. There is this like little cut here we are going to resize the image the image looks like this and we are going to predict to use the function predict from our model and we give an input the image resized here is the probabilities that i was telling you earlier so we have 10 probability one for each class and uh, yeah as you can see here cut to the to the class cut is associated probability of 0 0.77 that is 77 percent so the second most likely is frog 0 0.16 so you can actually see that our model was able to recognize and detect this as a cut so uh yeah this is basically our how to build a very easy model again this is gonna be on on git on bitbucket i don't know so uh, i don't know if you have any questions or or stuff, otherwise we'll we'll get going with with the slides. Again, I know it's it's pretty if you don't try by yourself, 
it's pretty theoretical, but yeah, hopefully I give you a kind of yeah, overview of how everything works. Can I explain? To the, okay, yeah. So uh, when you when you do stuff like deep learning, is there is again there is no like strict rules, so you will never know that you probably need I don't know two convolutional networks, and after you need a pooling one or if you need just one, or you don't know how many filters you have, you, you, you will need. So it's, it's basically a very like trial and error process. So normally, the, most, the more complicated is what you want to achieve, the more layer you will need. So when you use like pre-trained model, like one is called VGG, Visual Geometric, I think, developed, developed by Oxford guys. Uh, that is one of the most used pre-trained models. They, they use something like 512 layers. So it's it's pretty, again, it's pretty trial and error. For very easy, you can, you can, you can, let's say, use something like the model I showed you. But yeah, for very complicated tasks, you actually need to, there are some kind of rule of thumb, papers, research, but yeah, there are no like specific rules how to set number of layers, the batch size, number of epochs, and, and so on. Let me just load the slide again. So yeah, hopefully that answer to your question will. Actually, not like a real answer, but yeah, it's, it's what it is. <laughs> OK, so yeah. Uh, time is it? Yeah, okay. So at this point, you hopefully you will have a kind of general slash clear idea of how CN or what CNN is, when do we use, and how is structured. So now let's let's check something else. So considering that the most common task that a computer vision algorithm has to perform is object detection. So pre-existing image object detectors usually can be divided into two different categories. So these categories are one stage and two stage detectors or model. So when you actually see something that ends with RCNN, we are talking about two, uh, two stage model. So yeah, they didn't have a lot of creativity choosing the name because yeah, basically they did the same algorithm but just some like tweaks and yeah, the, the first one is RCNN after they had the fast CNN and the, let's say the state of the art is faster CNN. So this is two stage model and I will explain later why. Uh, these two YOLO, that means you only look once and SSD single shot detector. These are the one stage model. And by the way, these are stands for regional and we'll see later again why so yeah first of all let's let's explain what these two stage what actually two stage model one stage model means so uh if you have one input image like the one i showed you earlier with maximum one object so we actually just need to classify the image and we don't uh, uh so basically the output will be just a single number the label so like before zero, one, two, until until nine, if it was a number. However, if we have multiple objects, the problem is that the uh, if you have multiple objects in the input image, the output of the network has to tell us two different things. So the first thing is actually uh, what the object is, so the label. But the second thing is actually where the object lies into the image. Because if you have like multiple one, we should be able to match, you know, which is which. So the set of coordinates that do uh, that composes, let's say, is called the bounding box. Uh, so the box that actually tells us where the 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 box the the object is, uh, is a, another task that should be added to the classification. So we can actually identify two tasks: classification one that will uh, give us the uh, the the labeling output, and the regression task. So in a two-stage model. Classification and regression are performed separately by two different networks. 
in the one stage model, these two tasks are performed together by a single net. So yeah, here you can see some kind of pros and cons of one stage model. So the, the two stage model, generally speaking, yield higher accuracy because you know having two separate stage stage uh, this model perform better on object with various sizes. Uh, on the other hand, we have the, the one stage model like Hyolo SSD that have higher inference speed. And uh, also during the training phase, uh, they require less computational resources thanks to their simpler architecture. But yeah, even though, uh, like I said, the two stage model uh, produce higher localization accuracy, uh, looking at the latest one stage model version like Kyolo version 5, researchers were able to, to reach even like higher accuracy. But yeah, the thing, the most important thing to, to, bear, to bear in mind is that the increase in demand for real time detection, uh, like yeah, the, the use case we're going to, to see later. So the, the two stage models, it really cannot be used in real time. So now, probably also in the future, the one stage model will be probably the, the, the most common one. So now let's see what a two stage model is. So uh, the example will be the faster RCNN that is in theory the stage of the art. So the main structure is the convolutional layers, which extract like feature maps. So it basically all the stuff I said earlier, uh, uh, apply the kernels, pooling, dropout, and everything is, is done here. The RPN, that is the region proposal network, which generates proposal for object detection using the feature maps. ROI pooling is something that converts all the proposal to fixed shape. And again, at the end, fully connected layer, which sorry, produces the output. So let's analyze singularly every different steps. Okay, here there is another kind of practical view of how filter works. So a convolutional layer, like I said, applying filters which can detect shallow and deep features. In general, the deeper is the network, the more feature can be extracted from the from the input. And this can be an extension to what Willem asked, how do you choose basically the topology? So the, the more features and the more complicated is what you get in input, the more layer you should have. So let's analyze these very quickly. So the figure display basically eight feature maps per layer. So eight feature maps means that eight filters per layer have been applied. So there are some interesting observation uh, about the feature maps as we progress to the layer. So this is the, let's say, uh, is the shallowest layer. So is the, is, let's say is the first one that is, is, is called the block one com one. So the first layer uh, retain most of the information that are in the image. So usually the initial layers, they act as edge detectors. But yeah, as we go deeper, the, uh, the feature maps look like an abstract representation of uh, the input. So for example, if you see like block four and block five, you actually cannot think that this comes from the image of a cat. So at this point, we are looking at more complex stuff, like for example, the cat nose, the cat mouth, the eyes. So these, they are still encoding uh, important features, but they are less like visually interpretable by us. But yeah, they are still like very important in order to classify correctly the input image. So this is the first play, the, the first phase, the convolutional one, and normally it takes like the majority of the layers. So, for example, for the past CNN, if I if I recall in the correct way, there are like something like 80 slash 90 convolutional layers. So this is like one that take mo most time also during the, the training phase. After that, we have the RPN, the regional proposal network. So before explaining you this, uh, I need to introduce a concept that is the anchor box. So an anchor box is simply a box that is built using a pixel as a landmark. So in the default configuration of the faster CNN, nine anchors are generated for each position. So let's see what this means. So if we have an input image, for example, 800 by 600, for every single pixel, we are going to generate nine different anchor boxes. 
So we'll have three different groups based on the on the sites. So 128 by 128, 256 and 512. And each of these different sites will get different uh, width height ratio. So one, one, two, and one, two. So the first thing we need to do, we need to set up these uh, fixed size boxes. So when we finish this project, an image like 800 by 600 will look like this. And we will have in total more than 4 million uh, of anchor boxes. And as you can see, this is also always one of the reasons why we had padding. Because yeah, be, uh, be on the during, like the central pixels here, they will probably have more like overlapping boxes. But you know, the edge pixel that we have at the end, it they will not like be involved in the process too much, let's say, because it's just like one box is one anchor box will will cover it. So basically, yeah, in total, we have four million of boxes. And now let's see what we are going to do with this with these boxes here. So the first thing, yeah, as I, like I said, on each feature map, we generate anchor boxes. These anchor boxes are run through a three by three kernel style convolutional network with 512 channels. These are basically number of filter. But the important concept here is that we use two one by one kernel convolutional, where the first one will produce the background, the foreground class scores. So in order to do that, we basically calculate is called the IOU intersection over union of the ground the ground through boxes with anchor boxes. So the ground through is basically the boxes we human manually labeled when we want to label the the, the training image. An anchor boxes is generally considered to be a positive, so foreground, so basically that contains an object or something like that if it satisfies mainly one condition, that the anchor boxes has an IOU greater than 0 0.7 with any ground through box. This basically is the, is, is, the, is the beginning of the, let's say, the branch that will provide us the classification task. So it's just telling if, for now, if it contains an object or if that boxing is, is foreground. It's, a, it's just a background box. The second kernel is used to determine the coordinate of our positive box. So this basically we need to learn the offset of the anchor box coordinates respecting to the ground through. So for learning this offset, we need to have targets and these targets are basically uh, are basically generated by comparing the anchor boxes with the ground through boxes. So this target will be like the difference, the error we get from the ground through to the to the anchor boxes. And this process is called anchor target generation. So we are going to, to tell, so we, we want that the network has to learn how much we, 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 we were wrong. So the difference, be, again, between the anchor and the true boxes. So this process, again, calculate the different in coordinates. And uh, these different are learned by a regressor. This, uh, in, in, uh, in the next layer of the, of the network, these regression coefficients are used to improve the coordinates of the anchors that contains objects. So I know it's pretty kind of tough to explain, but yeah, we, again, the first one is about classification. So it just tells you if it contains a box. The second one will tell us how this anchor box is uh, is close to the ground through box that we, we label, that we actually draw during our labeling phase. And at the end, we'll just, of course, we'll just retain the boxes that we consider positive, and we'll also have a regression coefficient that will help us to improve our regression task, so our the generation of the coordinates for the, for the object that is, that appears in the image. So after this process, uh, we probably get some remaining boxes, but at the end, those boxes, they will contain just the, the value of the feature maps. Now, the problem is that because at the end, uh, like I said before, uh, at the end of every um, convolution neural network, we have uh, a fully connected layer. 
The problem is the fully connected layer needs to have all the same, all uh, uh, a fixed size input. So the problem here is that we need to to change all these different feature maps that are the anchor boxes. And probably these anchor boxes, like I, I show you, they have like different sizes. So we need to 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 create a fixed size. Uh, in order to do this, we do something called ROI pooling. And uh, basically, uh, ROI pooling is, is used for creating fixed sites. So imagine here the input we want is two by two. So we are going to divide uh, the feature map in in four parts. And again, we are we are getting the sorry the maximum uh, value that we have in this in this portion. So from the first one, we will get like 0 0.85. From the second one, we get 0 0.84, the third one 97, and here 96. But yeah, how you can you can see here, uh, uh, we are actually splitting, uh, retaining like different number of elements. So this is what originally was ROI pooling. Uh, because yeah, if it's like an odd number, for example, in this case, if it's odd number, you cannot like split by two. Normally, what is used now is something else called ROI Align that basically does the same, but it uses bilinear interpolation in order to split, even if it's odd, in order to split exactly in the middle, but of course to change, you know, for example, this value, because if we split like here, we are not going to get like 0 to 4. So we calculate bilinear, bilinear interpolation in order to split evenly and based on the input size of the full convolutional network, uh, the feature map. But yeah, the concept is still the same. So we are going to have fixed size input and we are going to get the maximum element from each portion of the image. OK, so now uh, we can see where the true stage happens. So again, the, the last layer is fully connected and has two tasks, generating the boundary box and the, the coordinates and the output label. So as you can see here, okay, we, again, we have very quickly CNN, we, we extract the features here. Here we have the ROI pooling stuff in the region proposal, the region proposal. And here we actually flatten everything. We have two fully connected layers. And here you have two branches. So one part of the network will be just in charge with object, object, object classification. So it will have like C units. This is a C, I don't know if you can see. C units, <coughs> one for each class. And this part of the network, it will be about uh, uh, the regression task. So just generating uh, the, the, uh, the coordinates. As you can see, you have like C times four units. So for each class, you have the four coordinates. So this is how a two stage uh, model works. And yeah, again, two different parts separate one for the classification and one for the regression. So now we're going to see how a one stage model works. So the most, the famous one, the most famous one is YOLO. You only look once. That is uh, um, for basically YOLO, the object detection is a simple regression problem, which take, takes an input, takes an input and learns the class probability and bounding box coordinates using a single network. And this is where like we have the single stage. So yeah, just quickly, the idea of building a one stage model comes from the fact that the all the information we need for the task, for the classification task and the regression task, they are contained into the feature maps that we generate. So it was natural to explore the possibility of, you know, grouping everything to one because we are we are starting everything we need is inside these feature maps. So why we should split in two if we, there is a chance we can do in a single stage? And this means less training time and more like inference speed. So let's see how YOLO works. Okay, this is the original implementation of YOLO. 
now in Yolo V5, almost everything is changed, but the the still the the process is the same. So okay, Yolo divides the input image into an S by S grid. Original was seven by seven, so we have like seven cells by seven cells here. Each grid, this is important, each grid is in charge of predicting only one object. What center falls inside the grid cell? So if you can see the image here, this uh, blue, uh, this blue box uh, is actually the, what we have labeled manually. And you can actually see that the center is this like blue uh, point. The center falls inside this cell that is the yellow one. So the yellow grid cell, you, you could actually think that would be in charge of predicting you know, the flowers, but is actually in charge of predicting the person object because the center of this object falls inside this grid cell. So uh, each, each uh, uh, basically, yeah, here there is something that YOLO shares with FASTL CNN. So first of all, we predefine two different shapes called again anchor boxes and uh, so they are not this blue here this is something else that we'll explain you now so yeah we defined uh, these anchor boxes uh, and for each grid cell we are going to instead of having one output we'll have two outputs and that these are basically the bounding boxes so you you need to be able to differentiate anchor boxes is what actually we do at the beginning, prefixed, prefix size, and yeah, all those stuff. Boundary boxes is actually what the, the network predicts. So in this example, the yellow grid makes two boundary box prediction to locate where the person is. And the object, and af after we actually do we uh, we calculate the, the the network predicts the the bounding box. The object is going to be assigned to the anchor box based on the similarity between the bounding box predicted and the anchor box that were like uh, set at the beginning. So just to give you a clear review of this, let's see all the process. So uh, each grid yeah, predicts a fixed number of boundary boxes. Again, so. Here we are, imagine that these are the, the clusters, the, the, every point is the, is the center of the grid cell. On, the, on B, we have the anchor box. So this is, is not like the, the, implement, the original implementation of Fiolo, it's a modified implementation, but it's still the same process. So as you can see, we do boundary, bo we do uh, anchor box that they quite, they're not very good at getting all the, all the, all the objects. After we apply all the CNN and all the stuff, these are basically the boundary box, the bounding box. So what the 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 network is predicted, and for example, for this version, uh, the network predicts like three of them. And after using this boundary box and this anchor box, so we are going to retain the one that most like look like uh, the, the the most similar one of the bounding box to the to the anchor one. And, we are, and using the, the, the coordinates, we are going to, you know, in this case, stretch the box predicted, and we are going to, to produce the one that actually is able to, to, uh, uh, to bound all the, 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 the object. So basically, yeah, again, this is the input image, anchor box, fixed sides, CNN, bound, bound, uh, bounding box predicted by the, the network, and we are going to use all this information from B and D in order to retain the best bounding box and to adjust the coordinates. So now let's see, but yeah, still I have not told you how the, the, the one stage actually, how it's achieved. So yeah, again, uh, for each grid cell, it predicts uh, B boundary boxes, to integer implementation, and each box is described by five parameters. So you have X, Y, W, and A, that is the center, width, and high, and something called the box confidence score. The box confidence score reflects how likely the, the box contains, the boundary box contains an object. I, I didn't say uh, 
a cat, uh, but an, uh, an undefined object. Again, it detects only one object regardless of number of boxes. And this is important. It predicts C conditional cloud probabilities, one per output cloud. So this tells uh, the probability of the object belong to a specific class given that something has been detected. So if this box confidence is, is quite high, we are going to get the class probabilities. I will say, and we actually calculate the probabilities that whatever has been detected here belongs to the class cat or belongs to the class dog or whatever. So supposing there are in total 20 classes in our data set, for example, the YOLO prediction has a shape seven by seven because it's the grid, two by five because we get two boundary boxes, uh, five values for each boxes, plus 20 because 20 is exactly the conditional class probabilities one for each class. So our final input shape, uh, output shape, it's seven by seven, Oh, sorry, I just need to connect the charger. Otherwise, my laptop is going to die. OK, so the yeah, the final shape is going to be 7 by 7 by 30. So the, the task of our network is, gonna, is, is just going to be to to predict 30 different values. And this is a regression problem. So we're not going to to do any classification anymore. And as you can see here, you can see all the, the structure. So YOLO has just 24 convolutional layers uh, that act as a feature extractor, two fully connected layers, this one's here, one, one here that you flatten a bit clean two, and they are responsible for classification and regression of bounding boxes. So this is actually the output we get. So 30 different values, analyze, analyzing all those values, we will be able to understand the class and the bounding box coordinates, and everything is going to be done into one network. So no branch, no parallel stuff. And this is because YOLO is widely used for real-time detection because it's able to perform detection on 45 frames per second, while faster as CNN in average is 10 frames per second. So you can you can imagine that for a real time problem uh, using a faster CNN that is a two stage model, it will not be the most suitable uh, thing to do. So yeah, this is for this is the end of yeah this two stage one stage. I don't know if you have any question, otherwise I'll move on. And basically, yeah, this YOLO is something similar to what Tesla uses. So, that, but yeah, we're going to analyze that use case later on. Hopefully, yeah, if we have time, but yeah, we'll let. So if you don't have questions, we go on another uh, topic, object detection versus image segmentation. So yeah, in computer vision, image, image segmentation is the process of partitioning an image into multiple segment. So each segment is a set of pixels which represent an image object. So to be clear, uh, uh, image segmentation, again, is the concept behind the self-driving car, which allows to recognize the road, the lane, uh, the pedestrian, and other cars at a pixel level accuracy. While object detection is basically, let's say, merely about detecting an object in an image, drawing uh, a box around it. So image, seg image segmentation, so while uh, object detection is just yeah, uh, assigning a label to the box, Image segmentation is assigned a label to every pixel. And so you can imagine how fun it will be to, to label manually a training set for image segmentation problems. So, okay, the one of the algorithms that were, let's say, most used is a mask RCNN. That is a deep learning method created by Facebook that can create a pixel-wise mask for each object in an image. So this method is basically an extension of a faster CNN by adding a mask branch that is used for predicting you know, the segmentation on each region of interest that are the one I explained to earlier. 
in parallel with the existing branch for classification and bounding box segregation. So this is still a true stage model. So yeah, we must CNN is just faster CNN plus FCN that is full convolutional network. Uh, you also have you also can achieve image segmentation using a one stage model. There is something called Maschiolo that achieves that in one stage. But yeah, for now, let's analyze this. So this is even slower than faster CNN because of course we're adding something else. So it runs five FPS. Okay, let's see what FS FCN is. So uh, uh, FCN is a neural network that only performs convolution. So down sampling or up sampling operation. Equivalently, an FCN is a CNN without fully connected layers. So at the end, we don't have fully connected layers. So the main concept here are the main concepts are the word down sampling or up sampling. So in the CNN, when we apply filters, we are down sample the, the input in order to create an abstract representation of the of the image. In the FCN, we basically up sample because during the down sampling, after uh, if we have like many layers, uh, after several convolutional box uh, blocks, uh, we can lose spatial information. So to fix this, we are going to fuse the output from deeper layers with those one from shallower layers, which contains more spatial information. This up sampling operation is also called transposed convolution. So if you heard like deconvolution, it's it's technically wrong. So it's a transposed convolution. So let's see how this transposed convolution works. Imagine you have these feature maps here and you to arrive here, you use this kernel. So to go, let's say to go backward, we are going to multiply the kernel by every cell of the of the input. And we are going, for example, for the first element zero, we multiply zero by zero, zero, one, zero, two, zero, three, and we have, and we keep in the output all the result. And after we sum all the output we get between the different application of the kernel. So at the beginning, we have zero. Second with one, we'll have one times zero, one times one, one times two, one times three. So we'll have zero, one, two, three. Same for two and same for three. And so at the end, we'll get a bigger output of the input we started from that will contain hopefully more information. Uh, yeah. So now let's see how F FCN looks like. So imagine uh, this is the final layer of the convolution after the pooling. So I showed you here three different type of of uh, up sampling, let's say. So we have this FCN32. So the output from pool five, this one here, is up sampled 32 times. So it's this is the result. The FCN16, the output from pool five, is up sampled by two. So we'll get one step back, uh, let's say, by two. And this is going to be fused with the, the, with the output from pool four. In, because they, they at this point they will have the same uh, the same size, so it, we can actually merge them, and we'll up sample by 16 times the prediction. And yeah, this is FCN eight. So the output from pool five is up sampled by two, merge with the pool four prediction, but the result of this is not going to be a up sampled by 16, but just by two, and this will get fused with the output of pool three, and we get the eight time up sample prediction. So yeah, of course, probably you, you don't get any difference in this, but in the next slide you will, because you can see the different results of, up, of different kind of up sampling and uh, merging stuff. So this is the ground true, every pixel labeled uh, in, the, in the correct way. So this is what we get from FCN32. Remember, 32, we don't fuse with anything else. We just get the output from pool 5, we up sample by 32 times. So yeah, the output doesn't look like very good. This is what we get from FCN16. 
where it actually just fuses with another output from pool 4. And this is what we get from FCN 8. So you actually you can actually appreciate that this FCN 8 looks quite similar to the ground true. So this is actually to demonstrate to you how the upsampling operation would can help. And uh, it actually is fundamental for for doing this uh, uh, segmentation task. So uh, this is was a very brief overview of how segmentation works. If you are more interested in that, you can send me an email because yeah, I I wrote some time ago a very detailed uh, I have a very detailed PDF document on image segmentation, so I can send it to you with all the maths, all the stuff. If you are interested in that, but yeah, if you don't have any question on this. We'll move on the use case I prepared. So yeah, this is the last, the last basically, yeah, 10 slides of the presentation. And I want to analyze a use case where computer vision has been applied more than successfully. So yeah, you probably know this guy. And uh, yeah, so the Tesla Autopilot is, it is one of the most advanced computer vision model ever deployed, I would add, of real time. Also considering the enormous consequences that can derive from making mistakes. So yeah, the Tesla Autopilot system has to deal with many well-known as well as very complicated tasks like lane keeping, lane change, cruise control, pedestrian tracking, driving in a parking lot, and smart summon. So smart summon is basically when you call your car, your car will come to you wherever you are, but relatively close, but yeah. So uh, some news that probably will be new for you. So yeah, every Tesla car is equipped with eight different cameras, which provide 360 degrees of visibility around the car at up to 50 meters of range. 12 ultrasonic sensor which helps with the object detection and radar which helps with the measurements of the speed of any object it sees detect so just a, a quick info by this here Elon Musk tweeted that they are going to remove the radar so because they actually realized that at least they realized yeah I'm not so sure but yeah, the, the, the computer vision model will be able to detect the speed of the object better than the radar. And uh, yeah, so probably in the, I think by this summer, they're starting to remove the radar. So yeah, they're just, no, now they went like completely uh, using the vision. Here is where are located the cameras. So you have, uh, like I said, eight cameras. So you have three here in the, you know, the top mirror you have in the car. So these cameras are responsible for detecting cars in the front. Also, you have two cameras here at the, on the side. It's responsible for the side, the side view and blind spots. And yeah, the same on the other side. You have a slide view camera that is responsible for side view again and blind spot these two violet, and you have one rear camera that will check everything that is happening behind the car. So you have like three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is the, the radar they want to, to remove. Uh, yeah, it measures the speed of any object it sees and, uh, and detects. And also you have, <coughs> sorry, 12 ultrasonic sensor that, yeah, for example, these uh, that basically measure distance to any object by using the sound waves. To give you a better view of how, what the camera does, here is uh, the field of view of every camera. So yeah, the three cameras on the top, one can see up to 250 meters, one up to 150, and you have the, this camera up to 60. These are the camera that you saw on the side, the, basically the violet one, Actually, no, these are the, the, the blue one here. The violet one are these seven and eight. They can see the blind spot on the back. And you have the rear camera that is max distance is 50 meters. 
So as you can see here, the Tesla it's able to see around like its car. It has all the cameras has basically a 360 degrees. So in theory, they will be able to to detect and if anything happened, uh, so they don't have any blind spots. So yeah, the three main actions that need to be performed in order to have an always up-to-date autopilot are data labeling, training the neural network, and testing. So let's see how the, the data auto-labeling works. So uh, the, the cool stuff, uh, let's say, is that we, um, whenever an, an, uh, an end user is whenever an, an end user is driving the car is let's say unwillingly collecting data in order to data that are normally auto labeled so it's a kind of super, semi supervised learning and there but there are also there is also human cleaning and verification and the good stuff is that all these data are not labeled on the car but on kind of offline networks and there is the benefit of hindsight. So it's basically, you know, they can like uh, take all the time they want to label the data and see if there is any mistake. And because yeah, that will be the data set that they are going to use to retrain or readjust, hopefully improving the, the, the performance of the model. So yeah, as you can see here, there is both they are able to do something that is called 3D computer vision. So they are going to get not just the, the box, but yeah, the 3D boxes and also they classify here. Yeah, the image is not very good, but yeah, a pixel level, all the, uh, yeah, they actually assign a label at every pixel that has been found inside the 3D box. So the once the data set is labeled, they can use to train the neural network. They actually, uh, initially they were using a neural network uh, that was provided by an Israeli uh, company, but now they've gone with their own neural network called HydraNet. So Hydra is the mythological kind of creature which has one body and many different heads. So these exactly reflect the structure of the data of the neural network that they are using. So this image represents the eight images, one for each camera. In this multicam fusion, they are going to they actually merge all these image into one very big image, and using uh, 3D CNNs, CNNs, transformers, and recurrent neural network RNN. They are going to, you know, uh, integrate to actually add, let's say, the time element inside all the image that they gathered. So here is basically when they do the, this is, let's say, the body. So where they're doing everything in common. After what they do, they have one single head, let's say, for each different task. So the good thing is that is if they realize, I don't know, that the lane changing, it doesn't work very well. They have just to modify a single head. They don't have to, to change all the structure, all the architecture, because that will take a lot of time. So basically, they are, going, they are just going to uh, modify the single head. So it's a very like decoupled system, let's say, because yeah, even something doesn't work, they're just going to change that thing because I, uh, Tesla basically to train the model. So uh, they are trained. So the, the initial training or, or release of the model, they train on 12 trillion, so trillion of images. And they have the the fifth super the most the fifth most powerful supercomputer on earth to do that. And basically for the training, uh, without doing uh, all the kind of a uh, trick they use to improve the the speed and the, also the same kind of performance. Generally, the train would uh, would have get would have gotten something like uh, seventy thousand seven hundred thousand of hours of training, and then you can understand seven hundred thousand of hours is 
is pretty is a pretty huge number. So using this hydronet that is that as I say, you just need to change something slightly uh, based on what is wrong. So this could save a lot of time. And they also have stuff like uh, 700 GPUs and all like very powerful stuff in order to train a very complex model and also that has to be let's efficient like 100% of the times because they're yeah, making mistake it could lead to horrible consequences so yeah this is the last slide so let's see how the the whole system works so yeah it may hopefully this is going to be me one day driving a tesla uh, actually i'm collecting data and i'm sending the data to uh, I, I, I'm going to send the data to the uh, to Tesla, the Tesla system, and basically when they actually get the something that is inaccurate, they do unit test. They basically boost, so they are kind of uh, detecting why this is wrong, and they are adjusting the label. They retrain the model, but the cool thing that they do is that when they deploy, they are not changing the system that is actually in charge of making, of taking the decision, but they are deploying the model is called in shadow mode. So they are going to basically uh, deploy the model. The model will take its own decision, but it's, going, it's not going to be affecting the behavior of the car. Because yeah, as soon as you have the shadow system, whatever is happening, is also be used to to check if there was any accuracy. So as you can see, this is a very like cyclic process. And uh, yeah, basically in this way they can they have like a real nice model. Even though, as you probably he hear, like there was some like problem. But yeah, like uh, I heard from the from the Tesla, uh, the main developer of. The, the lead developer of Tesla, this is going to be a model that in a couple of years they will be able to provide, uh, uh, they, will, they will be able to go down to 0% accident because, because yeah, now it's still getting some problem, but of course it's just a matter of, of training and stuff like this. Uh, yeah, this is the last slide. Hopefully I have given, I've given you some useful information and yeah i don't know do you have any question or something any final questions on uh for nunzio yeah nunzio it's jeff here um i've been listening kind of in background mode and uh, really interesting uh thank you um so i my question would be around, supposing I were trying to do, uh, you know, use a, an architect like this, uh, to do, not to recognize the image, but to recognize um, something um, about the image. So, um, you know, if I was if I was trying to recognize, um, uh, not recognize a dog, but recognize whether a dog is, um, I don't know, is, is lying prone or standing up. Um, uh, would there be any changes to the architecture? So, for example, would I get rid of the um, the max pooling layers if I was trying to look for that sort of difference? You know. <laughs> so uh, basically, yeah, that is the specific problem you said is something called pose estimation, and uh, so you can imagine basically that yeah, the the CNN, the stuff that I showed you, they contains all the basic operation you will probably need. But of course, based on the on on the task, it's it's going to be changing, but it's probably probably yeah, the topology of the structure will be completely different. But you will still keep if you want to get features, uh, you will still keep something like emotional layers and also max pooling. But yeah, the exact use case you mentioned post estimation, it's something that is used, for example, in uh, sport activities. To detect if uh, a basketball player has a nice posture when he's, he's shooting or if should improve in something else. So that particular case, there is some different theory behind that. But you know, the base it's still like build some convolutional layers, uh, get some features, uh, 
uh, in order to you know analyze in the in the best in the most efficient way the input image yeah okay thank you Thanks, Jeff, for the um, cool question. Um, any other questions you may want to raise, anyone? Well, if what? not, oh, yeah, there we go. Ah, there's a hand up. C, Carl. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for your talk. Uh, it was wonderful. Um, I, I sort of, if it's possible to repeat, I sort of missed how how is in the Tesla Hydronet uh, network? How are the heads decoupled? Because you mentioned that one one is enough. Is it like a parallel network? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So as you can see here, there are like multiple uh, arrows, and basically uh, every uh, every task is starting from uh, the features, the some like common features that are like uh, gathered on this face. But you know, if something doesn't work, because everything will have a kind of different architecture, different structure. So if anything doesn't work, they're just going to modify the this little branch, and they're not going to touch the rest of the architecture. Uh huh. Okay. Thank you. And and may I ask? You mentioned that you you could, for those who wanted, uh, send a PDF documents of uh, your lecture notes. Would you post your email, perhaps, and or or send uh, it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, I will. Uh, I mean, we'll maybe send. Yeah, uh, we we get th so through the uh, the meetup. Um, oh yeah. Platform. Uh, it's very easy to uh, just send your uh, messages there and and reach uh, reach us. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. It will also. Oh, sorry. Those slides will also contain a very detailed explanation about faster CNN and all the maths behind it. So yeah, I will. Yeah, I will send it to you. No problem. Thank you. No, thanks for your question. Thanks for being here. Any other one? If not, then um, I'd like to uh, thank Nunzio for a wonderful talk again. Um, Hopefully we um, uh, yeah we enjoyed uh, uh, we all enjoyed uh, being here. Um, I certainly did. Um, learned a few bits and bobs here and there. That's awesome. Um, we're gonna share the video on our YouTube channel um, and um, yeah communicate through through the Meetup channel, uh, the Meetup uh, platform that is cool. Um, we'll also uh, do another one of those in um, in about six weeks' uh, time, um, ready for Christmas. Um, there's a couple of um, uh, a couple of um, topics that we have in, on our list, but we'll uh, we'll keep you uh, posted on that. Um, then, um, well, thanks all, and um, yeah, hope to see you in uh, in six weeks' time. So yeah, thanks, thanks, William, and thanks, Suzanne, for.